And welcome to the magic of mindfulness, becoming the responsive leader in your life. Uh, my name is Jamie Valderrama, and I am so excited and honored to get to be here with you in this speaker series, because really, I feel like this information I'm about to talk about is critical to what we all do, those of you who are practicing in the field right now, and those of you who are getting ready to go into the field, because really, we can't give what we don't have. So being able to self-regulate, center ourselves, allows us to be the people that we need to be professionally and personally to make the greatest impact that we wanna make. And that's why everybody's in this field. We know that we can't fight darkness with darkness. We've gotta figure out how we're gonna be that light. So this is titled, The Magic of Mindfulness, Becoming the Responsive Leader in Your Life. And I always love to begin with the slide where it looks like Kung Fu Panda, the outline. And the reason I use it, is because if you ever watched Kung Fu Panda, he was meant to be this amazing ninja warrior, yet he didn't believe he was capable of being what everyone else around him thought that he was supposed to be. So one day, Master Ugwe took him to the top of the hill, and he said something to him that I know that you've all heard. He said this, yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, today is a gift, that's why it's known as the present. It gives you goosebumps, right? He's basically telling them, listen, get out of your head. You can't be who you're meant to be if you're constantly in the future or in the past. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today is how can we train the brain to be present so that we can fully be capable of being who and what we're meant to be both personally and professionally. So as we start this, I want you to think about it. Are you mindful or is your mind full? This is one of those really kind of reflective pieces. And we've got to pay attention. And a lot of us, a lot of times, don't like to really pay attention to everything that's going on in our minds. We wake up in the morning, and if we feel really good, we're really, we're really easily, we can say, oh, I feel good. I'm excited. I have energy. But boy, if we work up, wake up and we have a little bit of anxiety or depression, how many of us are like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm anxious today. We don't. In fact, we try to move away from it. We try to distract ourselves. We'll try to numb it. So the goal here is to really, really pay attention to all those light and dark pieces in us and recognize, are we here in this moment or are we thinking? Are we disconnected from the body in the future or the past? And maybe even in the short period of time that I've been talking to you, you've already been thinking about something else like, what I'm going to get to eat later, or, oh, I need to get, a, I need to get a cup of coffee, or, oh, I need to call this person or get this task accomplished. So I want to talk about what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is purposely being present without an expectation or a judgment. Sounds really, really easy, right? But it's not easy. And we all know that. So what does it mean to truly be present without an expectation or a judgment? It means that we come into an experience and we're aware of physiologically what's going on, we're aware psychologically what's going on, and we're not bringing any baggage with us or expectations with us. And as humans, we are so good at having labels and expectations. I mean, you probably have an expectation of how you think this whole presentation should go. We have expectations of how we think our relationships and conversations should go. So we wanna get rid of that. We just wanna be in this moment. And I always use a picture of an, an image of a child because children are really good at this. And a lot of it's just because of brain development. They're very much in their moment. So you never see a six or seven year old who's going out to the playground with another friend. They're sitting there and the one friend says to the other, hey, let's play. And the one child says, no, no way. I, I got to process that Play-Doh incident that occurred earlier. Um, just give me a minute. They don't do that. Right? It's not to say that children don't experience trauma. Obviously they do, but they're very much capable and able to be in the here and now. And again, we're going to talk about the brain in a moment. And a lot of that does deal with brain development. So the big question is, why is this important? It's important because we know that the average American is lost in thought 47% of the day. This, so this was a study that came out of Harvard. And if you think about this, this is almost half of our day that we're lost in thought. And that seems really crazy, right? But what's going on? Well, what we recognize is this. When it gets quiet and we're not engaged in some activity at work or in a conversation with someone, we've trained our brains to default in the certain neural patterns. Some of us, when we sit down and get really quiet, we start to ruminate, meaning that we start thinking about the past. It can be short-term, it can be long-term. What we know about this, though, is that if we consistently do it, and it's taking us back to these moments that are challenging or triggering for us, it can actually lead to depression. It's almost like visiting a car accident 
and just rehashing it over and over and over. You can't change that the accident occurred. And so you're constantly going back and reliving the trauma of it. Now, does mean that thinking about the past is bad? Of course not. We need to be able to think about the past for self-reflection and growth. It becomes detrimental when it starts hijacking your present moment and it's taken away from what you're capable of doing right now. So some of you guys are like, okay, I get it. Rumination, thinking about the past. So what's the other route we usually take? Well, if we're not thinking about the past, what do we do? We sometimes start thinking about the future. We project, we play the what if game. And we know that projection clinically can lead to anxiety. So what is a what if game? What if this relationship doesn't work out? What if I can't pay my bills? What if they discover I'm an imposter, right? And so we do this all the time. And what we do is we create these storylines that are non-existent. In fact, Mark Twain had a great quote. It went something along the lines of, most of the tragedies that have occurred in our lives are those we've made up. And isn't that incredibly true? We are so quick to go from zero to 60 the minute we get hold of something. And it can be a document that we read up, maybe something we need to accomplish at work or a case that's really complex. And we've been like, what if I can't do this? What if I can't be the person I need to be for these people professionally or personally? And so it takes us right down this, this rabbit hole. And so again, is it bad to think about the future? Of course not. We need to be able to think about the future and we need to be able to plan. It becomes detrimental when it hijacks your present moment. And so that's what we have to become aware of is that we ourselves have created these neural connections, whether we're ruminating, thinking about the past, it's like going to the gym and only doing bicep curls, we get really strong biceps, or whether we're projecting and thinking about the future where we can only go to the gym when we work our triceps, right? So we get really powerful triceps. And some of you are like, Jamie, let me tell you something. I am so good at both, right? Like I can project and I ruminate. I am both depressed and anxious. And we can kind of laugh a little bit about that. But really the thing here is to recognize that we're doing it. And that's where mindfulness comes into this. It helps us become aware that we're starting to default into these maladaptive thought patterns that are not beneficial for us. Because bottom line, we recognize that when we're present, we're happiest. And that is where we want to be. So how do we do it? I know you're all like, well, what do we do? We train the brain to be mindful. This is a brain game. This is about the neuroscience, neuroplasticity of being able to change our perceptions. So if we look at the brain, this is a trilune brain, very simplistic model of brain development, where you look at the reptilian brain, which is really your brain stem. And that's where all of our autonomic features like heart rate and respiration occur. It's called reptilian because it's the oldest. Then you see the limbic brain, which is really mammalian. And here we're going to have emotional regulation. Also located here is the amygdala, which which is that gatekeeper to fear and anxiety. And then finally, our newest portion is going to be the neocortex. And that's our critical thinking and cognitive thought. When all three portions of the brain are communicating with one another, your nervous system's in something called parasympathetic. It's rest or digest. Everything is working beautifully. Your digestive system's working really well. You're sleeping really well. We want to be here. But there is something anti to this that is just as critical, and it is the sympathetic nervous system. It is there to protect you. And what's interesting about this is that we go into that sympathetic nervous system when we perceive, and this is important, perception, we perceive a threat. That threat can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be spiritual. So if we look at this and we perceive there's a threat, it's interesting. Look what happens with the brain. Remember when we're in parasympathetic, all three parts of the brain are communicating. But when we move into the sympathetic state, we disconnect the neocortex and we go into this primitive loop between the limbic and the brainstem. Why do we do that? This is part of protecting you. If you walked outside today and there were a horde of zombies coming towards you, does your brain want you to be like, oh, I wonder why there are zombies here today. Maybe I'm gonna text my friend and ask and ah, what happens, you get eaten. Your brain wants you to not be critically thinking right now. It wants you to get away from the threat. Once you're safe, it allows you to come back to homeostasis and now you can process. Now look what else happens. When you are triggered and you go into this state, your immune system, digestive system gets, systems get put on the back burner. Anybody think those might be kind of important in the middle of a pandemic, right? And so what we have to recognize is, are we constantly in this state because we're stressed or are we legitimately going into this state if we're being chased by the T-Rex? If we're being chased by the T-Rex, 
Go into sympathetic. Absolutely. That's what it's there for. But if this is your life, there's chronic stress at work and at home, then this is something where we have to be mindful, purposely pay attention and step back and recognize, do we need to be going into this triggered state as often as we're going into it? So we know that stress, it's not good. It's not bad. It's part of life. And I'm actually going to say the stress can be really, really good for you. It just becomes detrimental when it controls you versus you controlling it. Just like we talked about ruminating and projecting. It's not bad to think about the past or the future unless they control you versus you controlling it. So we want this alignment between our body and our brain. And the way to do it is to be paying attention to what is going on with the body. Physiology drives psychology that drives physiology. Think about that. It's very interconnected. So when you recognize, when you're mindful and you're paying attention and you recognize that you're being triggered, your heart rate is accelerating, maybe you're, you're balling up your fists or you're starting to breathe heavier, or you're getting that sick feeling in your stomach, you can say to yourself, do I need to be going into this heightened alert state? Do I need to go into sympathetic where I'm going to disconnect my neocortex? Or can I step back and can I self-regulate? And we know that breath work is really, really powerful in being able to do this. So we have informal and formal. The informal is just that quick breath work that helps you step back and say, okay, let me recenter. And what's interesting about this, when you look at this different types of breath work, and I just put a few examples up, the box breath, which is a 444, Dr. Andrew Wiles, a 478. What you're doing here is you're inhaling through the nose for that first count. So for the 444, you inhale through the nose for a count of four. You hold it for a count of four, and then you forcibly exhale through the mouth for a count of four. And you're going to do this a few times, and it's really amazing how quickly it helps the nervous system deregulate. Why? When you do that first inhale through the nose, you're actually triggering the vagus nerve, which is now going to interface with the parasympathetic nervous system and say, hey, listen, we're going to step back. We're going to calm down. We don't need to go into this highly reactive state. You'll also notice when you start meditations, they'll have you start with the breathing, paying attention as you inhale through the nose as you pause, as you exhale, and then they have you get into a breathing rhythm. And again, it's because we are actually triggering physiologically the nervous system to step back and calm down. This is great to use anywhere at any time. You get that email, you've got a difficult client, you're in traffic, or you're starting to get into a ruminative or projective thought pattern that is not beneficial. Step back and do some breath work. But where I really think the magic occurs is with our formal meditation. And that is where we take time to purposely train the brain to be present. If we are creating these neural connections of projection and rumination, we've spent a lifetime doing it. They become very powerful. So what we want to do here is weaken those neural connections and strengthen our neural connection to present moment. And that way, our perception starts changing. This is neuroplasticity. We're rewiring the brain. Data has shown us it takes as little as three weeks of 10 minutes a day to literally change your brain. Think about this. Three weeks. 10 minutes a day to literally change your brain. What we see happen is that the neocortex becomes thicker. So we have more focus and responsiveness and we see the amygdala shrink. So we naturally become less fearful and less anxious. I mean, that's pretty powerful if you think about that. If meditation's not for you, that's fine. You don't have to sit down and do a guided meditation. You can do somatic exercises like yoga, tai chi, qigong. These are ways that the body actually calm the mind down. And if you're like, oh, I don't really want to sit and do a meditation and I don't really want to go and do a moving meditation. Hey, you can just utilize your senses. It's a brain game. The minute you utilize your senses, sight, touch, hear, taste, smell, you're bringing in data from the surrounding environment. And when you do that, the brain has to be present so that it can make sure that you're safe. It wants to analyze everything you've brought in. So this is an excellent way to train the brain to be present. You could be going out and do a mindful walk. You could just be mindful doing the dishes and really paying attention to your senses or even just eating or doing a hobby that you really enjoy, maybe art or music. So again, the whole purpose of a meditative practice is to strengthen neural connections to present moment and weaken neural connections to these default patterns or thought patterns that have not benefited us. And finally, gratitude. You know, what's good in your life? It is really, really easy to default into a negative thought pattern and stay there. What I want to challenge you with gratitude is when you hit something that's triggering, pay attention to it, lean into it. What's happening to you physically? What's happening to you psychologically? And then I want you to say to yourself, but what's good? Well, I woke up. 
How blessed am I to have a family that loves me? Wow, I've got a job where I really get to help people. And it could be something as simple as I have strong legs that carry me through the day. So gratitude is incredibly powerful in helping us rewire and change the brain and change that perspective of what we look for in the world and not just see the negative, but also really train it to look for the positive. Because really bottom line, my friends, mindfulness, it's a choice. When you pay attention to your experience, you have a choice to do something or to do nothing. One of my favorite quotes from Viktor Frankl, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And that space is our power to choose our response. And our response lies our growth and freedom. Know that you cannot give what you don't have. This is not being selfish. It is critical that you fill yourself with what you want to give this world, because then you can be that change that will make it a better world. I really, really appreciate you all taking the time to watch this. And um, I, I hope that you share this and you practice this. And as you go forward, that you, you move forward very responsibly versus reactively. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.